You ready, Monsignor? I'm ready. Welcome back to Tuesday Tea with Turo. I'm here with the very, very venerable Monsignor James C. Turo. I am, I guess, the host, Father Patrick. And uh, we are, we're back with a Q&A session. I thought we started off, though, with just uh, chatting about how's it going, Monsignor. It's very well. It's quite acceptable weather, but uh, I'm feeling fine. A little cloudy, a little dreary out there. I saw the sun peek out for a couple minutes, um, but uh, we'll get by, I think. I also thought we just rearranged his sun parlor here. I think we're gonna have to come up with a name for this chapel of yours here. He's got the best room in the house. Let me give you a little tour real quick. So we've got where Monsignor sits. He's got his lamp. Uh, he's got beautiful windows here wrapping all the way around still going still going we got more windows more windows and this is the part that we just rearranged this is where we celebrate mass for all of you we have a beautiful crucifix from Oberammergau Germany and that icon down there of our lady and the infant Jesus with two angels on the side that was from one of my friends as an ordination gift God bless Father Anthony Di Stefano from St. Joseph's in Ordo. Shout out to you. Yeah, and wrapping around, this is uh, the normal living space. And back here we are with Monsignor. So if you're wondering if Monsignor's having a hard time, definitely not, because he's got the best room in the whole house. We're all envious of him. As he deserves. That is absolutely right. And I think there's... Someone on your teacup here. Yeah. You know who that is? Who's that? John Paul II. Yeah. Is that someone who, that was uh, big back in the day? Yeah. John Paul? Probably someone, uh, one of our great popes of late. And I have St. John Vianney, the patron saint of diocesan priests, on my cup. For all of you budding uh, priests out there, or seminarians to be. Uh, here's to you. Here's Pray to this guy. This guy was the best. And if you really want to become a great priest, pray to St. John Vianney. And, and John Paul II wasn't a bad guy himself. So cheers, Monsignor. He is drinking his normal Lipton tea with a little bit of cream and two Splenda. And I am drinking today winter chai from the same tea forte as last week's. Hey, Monsignor. You ready for some Q&A questions? Is that not difficult? <laughs> well, if they are difficult, just make up an answer. Huh? Um, close down all these other things I have open. All right, here we go. People want to know. Well, let's start with a light one. Hmm. Did you ever play sports growing up, Monsignor? Oh, I did, yes. Um, I grew up in the city, so, you know, the... Uh, well, the possibilities for the strong sports program weren't there, but uh, yeah, I, I did the usual sports that anyone growing up in my time would have uh, been involved in. What kind of sports are those, Monsignor? Well, stick ball mostly. When you didn't like another player, would you go hit them with the stick? Or is that just later on in life? No, no, <laughs> no part of it. <laughs> good, good. So you were a fair player. Uh, no, I'd be lying if I said I was. <laughs> and Monsignor does not lie, so he will uh, plead the fifth on this particular question. All right, but you still follow Seton Hall basketball when it was going. I remember see seeing you down here watching the games with Father oh, Bob. Yes. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. You got to support. Before that, that um, I was always interested in, in, in the sports program at St. Peter's Prep, which is my alma mater. And Where is St. Peter's Prep on senior? Oh my God, I thought the whole world was aware of it. And in Rome? Based oh, in no. Jersey City. Can anything good come from Jersey City, Monsignor? Yes, well, I like Father Toro. <laughs> Yeah, St. Peter's uh, was a, is a Jesuit prep school, and uh, in fact, the oldest parish in the archdiocese 
is St. Peter's, which is named after St. Peter's downtown in Manhattan. <laughs> because in the real, real ancient times, the Catholics living on this side of the Hudson River, uh, they belonged to that parish. Every Sunday they had to get into a rowboat and cross the Hudson to get to Mass on Sunday at St. Peter's, St. Peter's Church. They'd have to go in a rowboat. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, there were no ferries at that time. A rowboat? Well, how long ago are we talking here? Yeah. I don't know. I hesitate to put a date on it, but the very beginning of life <laughs> <laughs> in this part of the world. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, that just goes to show you, if it, it gets to Sunday morning and we can get back to church, then we have no excuse for not getting to church, because it... He had to go on a rowboat to get there, though I think some of us might actually like that. All right, well, thank you for sharing that little tidbit about your past. Jersey City, uh, when were you born, Monsignor? When? Yes. 1922. Wow. A long time ago. long time ago. And uh, what day? Of January 26th. January 26th. So keep that in your calendars. Monsignor Turrell loves presents. <laughs> uh, well, that was a, another question here is, what's the secret, Monsignor? How do you live to live 98 years old? Well, it's mostly virtue. <laughs> mostly virtue. <laughs> Pushing it aside or uh, No, no, no being uh, what I am. You know? mm -hmm. What would you say is your greatest virtue, Monsignor? Humility, I think. <laughs> there, I have so many that I have no difficulty in sorting them out. <laughs> so we're keeping them in order. Yeah, well, I th we all think that you are a living saint, Monsignor, except for those of us that live with you. Yeah. We all know the truth. My kid, he, he's great to, to live with. He, he brings much joy into our lives. What is your vocation story? Oh, well, um, I guess uh, I'd have to take note of the fact that I grew up in a very religious family. I had two aunts who were sisters of charity, uh, my mother's sister and my father's sister. So um, religion and religious life was very much part of uh, my early upbringing. I went to appropriate school too and uh, had uh, really, really uh, superb teachers, Sisters of Charity. Uh, I grew up in Jersey City, which generally at that time was predominantly Catholic. So I've heard, yeah. So you had a lot of people who were very devoted towards the Lord in your family. Oh yes, yeah. Yeah, we were all, they were all practicing Catholics. But that's still doesn't answer the question, what about your vocation? How did you embrace it? Well, um, I say since religious life was very much part of my, fa my background, uh, my family, um, when uh, I can remember in the first grade, a uh, sister asking uh, uh, who, was going, who would like to be a priest, uh, I, not alone, but I with maybe three or four others put up our hands. So it goes that far back in time. Uh, I, I don't recall wanting to, to do anything else, as a matter of fact, than to be a priest. What drew you to the priesthood? Well, as I say, I, I, uh, the subtle influence of a religious family, I think, was what brought it about. Yeah, I, I have met many religious in my life. I don't think I have any religious in my family. But what I love about the religious is that they live life so deeply. They have the Lord so real in their lives. And when you have that, you can't just, you can't but overflow with joy that flows yeah. over to others. And so it sounds like that happened with you a, a bit. Yeah. Among my earliest memories were <coughs> visiting my aunts at the uh, 
at the Mother House of the Sisters of Charity in Convent Station uh, once a month. It was visiting day when they were when they were novices, and uh, we would make the, uh, the trip by train to Mar Marstown and uh, visit with them one Sunday a month. For those of our listeners who don't know what a novice is, what's a novice once a year? Well, a novice is someone preparing to be a religious, either a priest or a sister. Would you say it's kind of like the equivalent of a seminarian? Oh, yes, exactly, yeah. So someone preparing to be a priest goes to seminary. Someone preparing to live the life of religious for the rest of their lives and permanently goes through what's called a novitiate. They become novices. That comes from the word novus, meaning new. So they're new to the life, and so they're testing the waters. They're saying, all right, is this what the Lord is calling me to? And so they take however long, uh, and then I don't know how long the novitiate was with the sisters. I think it usually is one year, two years, could be many more years before you take and make vows. And those vows, as a reminder to the people, are poverty, chastity, and obedience. That's across the board for all religions. So you had a lot of religious people in your family. Yes. And that really formed you when you were young. But I imagine there was some point when you were an adult where you said, all right, I'm going to enter now. Were there other people at that point who influenced your life to enter the seminary, let's say? Yes, the parish priests were very eager to, uh, not just uh, to get me to consider the priesthood, but uh, the, other, uh, the others too. They were very active in, in stirring up vocations to a priesthood and um, were very eager after I graduated from St. Peter's Prep to see that I should go to Seton Hall uh, and then get involved in a, a preparatory program, preparatory to entering the seminary. Mm. Yeah. So a parish priest kind of urged you to oh, consider. Yes. Yeah, they very much encouraged it. Uh, encouraged it. Yeah. Well, do you have any words of encouragement for any young men and considering going into the priesthood or religious life or some young ladies who want to become consecrated themselves? Any words of encouragement? Yes, frankly, I am. I wonder why there should be the falling off that there is right at the moment of vocations to the priesthood and to the religious life. Um, I think if there's a feeling now, uh, as it ever was, but very few people are considering it. I, I think more than anything else, it's the collapse of the parochial school that's responsible for that. Mm -hmm. That a Catholic child growing up in a public school system uh, is never, never told that one of the possibilities of the future, his future life would be as a, a religious or as a priest uh, in, in school. You know, the, all the professions are spoken of, the lawyer and doctors and whatever. Um, but uh, I'm quite sure that in a public school they don't make much of a vocation to a priesthood or to a religious life mm -hmm. for girls. Yeah, and even here we used to have religious sisters who would work in the schools yeah. in religious education, but because the numbers have dropped, yeah. the kids don't have them to see, yeah. to see what someone who rejoices in the Lord looks like. And someone who has given up everything for the Lord and to see how very joyful the Lord makes them because we have offered to him everything uh, and that's yeah that is very sad to me I would love to have brothers and sisters come here religious brothers and sisters come here to be that shining light for all of us now, I myself have need to go visit nuns and go visit brothers because they exude a joy that is hard to mm, always have when we're always in the mill, we're always working, we're always studying. 
and they have they do study they do work but they make prayer such a huge part of their life that they set time aside they schedule in the prayer time uh, and they pray for us but when you have such a strong relationship with jesus with the trinity with our lady then life becomes truly joyful you desire to go out and love others you have true peace in your heart uh, and it's hard to find nowadays to find that in people that's why that's why the religious are there to be the shining lights for us and so it is sad but hopefully in the future we can bring some religious here to 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 talk to our children to show them that yeah there are professions which is how you make money to if you have are called to raise a family than to make money to support your family but there is a concept much more important which is called the vocation and everyone is has the same vocation for holiness the same vocation to get to heaven but then there is what they call the secondary vocations of marriage of orders like the priesthood uh, bishop priest and deacon and then there is in my opinion, the highest of them, all of them, which is the consecrated life, where people marry and wed Christ himself. And when you give yourself over to Christ completely, that means you say, all right, Christ, now you have to take care of me. And he makes life amazing. So, uh, yeah, thank you for bringing up the topic. It brought on a much longer conversation than I intended, but I think this is a, a great place to stop for this time. Would you like to say a final prayer and blessing, Monsignor? Right. Well, I'm just uh, kind of all cast today. Uh, of course, it's not of God. It's comfortable to think of God in his goodness watching over us. But may Almighty God bless us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Monsignor. If you have any questions for Monsignor Turo, uh, I will put up an email address on the bottom so that you can send in your questions. Ask him anything and everything. We love talking to Monsignor Turo. He, he loves talking, even though he's a very quiet man. He, he, he blabs at the dinner table. He just goes on and on and on, uh, mostly complaining about the, the temporary administrator. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I have really a case against him. <laughs> He's trying to get me kicked out, but I'm very happy to give up the position to anyone that wants it. So if you're willing to take up the temporary administrator position, it's yours. It's all yours. Uh, Monsignor, God bless you. Thank you very much for being with Thank us. You. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next week. What do you think, Monsignor? It's still going. It's still going, but I can edit it out, so. <laughs> Is it still yeah, going? <laughs> oh, that's going in, Monsignor. <laughs> Are you putting that in the bloopers? <laughs> the side, Mons yeah, Monsignor Terry, you've never seen before. <laughs>
Barry's tea. It's uh, kind of the famous Irish tea. I think it's Irish. Yeah, Irish or English? I've had it. Never Are you like, yeah? I don't really it. can't tell the difference in my tea. But you're a connoisseur of chocolate cakes. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Under all circumstances, at any, at any day, of, uh, at any time, day or night. What about, have you ever been to the Coca Cola factory? In Atlanta? Where is that? Atlanta, Georgia? No, why is there a, isn't there Coca Cola? Because they have all these different varieties of Coke. There are varieties. Yeah. They have different types of Coke for different countries because people's palates are different, so they kind of design their Cokes according to the palate of the people. But I wonder if they have different types for Diet Coke. That'd be interesting to, to see. Get you a, a taste testing of the different types of Diet Cokes. Well, I was completely unaware of that. <laughs> well, I'm here to enlighten you of all such insignificant facts of life. You like coffee? No, I, uh, uh, I don't. I, how shall I put it? Yes, I like it, but it, um, I, I don't care for its effects on me. I, uh, Where you get irritable? And that's normal, though. <laughs> no, it was, because how could you explain me at all in the times that I have that <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> You make a valid point. No, but it's certain people that made, that made me irritable. Like, like Father Bob and Deacon Jay? No, I mean, it's not I'm nice not. to gossip about them when they're not here. I am so much at ease in their company. I look forward to it all the time. It's someone else, for sure. The health aid? No health aid. But Who else is there? Can't say enough good about them. Hmm. Who are you thinking of, Monsignor? Well, I hate to be direct. It's impolite to be direct. And, you know, that's why we have things like, uh, you know, uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, your uh, is it suit, his um, pleasure to have another cup of tea instead of saying, "Will you have another cup of tea?" Oh yeah, so is that a, like a British thing? No, like it's very common in the in the, uh, the uh, languages on the continent. The third person in German, French, and Italian. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. So, anyway, <laughs> if I say, you know, he is getting on my nerve, uh, he is getting on my nerves. You know? That would be inappropriate. You'd have to be very uh, no, no, indirect no, about it. Because it's third person. Oh, so this person you're talking about who gets on your nerve, That's you can right. say, oh, I see, I see. Uh, but we yeah. still don't know who you're talking about, right? Well, yes, <laughs> at least if you are German or Italian, uh, you would understand that I mean, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> see, English is terribly direct, it's cruel. Oh, I see. Well, how would you say it in German, where you would, uh, uh, I mean, would you be saying, I hate you, or would you be no, saying something say he would. He, he, uh, he is just, oh, ich, ich hasse ihn. What does that literally mean? I hate him. <laughs> but the Germans would be direct? No, no, they would say, they would say, I hate him, meaning I hate you. Okay, how do you, so is that what you said, I hate him? Say it again. Also in, in, in. What about uh, Italian? Io odio, io ti odio. I hate you, odium. How do you say, I love Father Patrick? There's no way of putting that in. I was saying it convincingly. <laughs> ich liebe dich. What does that mean? No, that's in there. I love you. In there. That's also the title of a famous song in German. Say it again. Ich liebe dich. Ich liebe dich. It doesn't sound very romantic. Well, it is. But that's the German side of you, where you have to be very indirect with your compliments. Your insults and your compliments have to be very indirect, it seems, right? Oh, yeah. Because uh, you are in charge, usually. If, for instance, I, I, I want to be proper, I would say, um, so 
easy since the free English law. What I've actually said is, they are satisfied, are they? But what I mean is you're satisfied, aren't you? You would make me plural? Plural and third person. Third person plural. It doesn't seem like German people are very close to one another. <laughs> Three happy years in the German seminary. Hmm. I would do it all over again if I had to. To go back to the German sem yeah. seminary? I recall, most of all, my first night there, <clears throat> we'd all arrived for the beginning of class, and it was the first time we all met together. And uh, after dinner, it should have been a night, dinner was at 8 o'clock, you know, as it is in Rome, and this would have been 10 o'clock, dinner was over, and recreation. And I went up to my room, which opened up on, a, on like a roof garden. And I went out and I thought to myself, what am I doing here? <laughs> Every other student in this seminary, that I had met them all, has been in either the German Army, Navy, or Air Force. <laughs> and then there's me. From America. <laughs> Right after the Second World <laughs> War, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> it was, see, the, seminar, the reason I was at the German college is that it was right after the war, the American college hadn't reopened. The first one to reopen in Rome was the German college. And the archbishop said to me, uh, I'll put you there for the year, but remind me next year and I'll transfer you to the American college. <laughs> I never reminded him. <laughs> So you having, revel, you, huh? I had a good time there at that place. <laughs> and you know what it did, of course, it made you see that uh, what made us together uh, was the fact of the, the faith in our vocation and whether they were German and I was uh, American. Yes, it made any difference at all, you know. But the fact that we were all uh, priests, that's what mattered. Yeah. I wish we could realize that in the world, yeah? We, we find so many ways to divide ourselves from one another. And just, uh, yeah, why can't we unite ourselves in Christ? One day, that'll be heaven. Until then, we'll just keep fighting. You will keep saying, I hate him. <laughs> in your many languages. <laughs> Do you have a favorite memory from the seminary? Oh, me, huh? I had a lot of good times there. Did you ever do any pranks? Oh, well, yeah, we used to do all kinds of things. Like what? We did more in those days than we did to do whatever attempt now. Well, that's for sure. I can't think of any, uh, of any some of, between some of the things that used to be done. Like on a regular basis? Oh yeah, like I, well, when I was, before going to Rome, I was at the seminary and I remember, for instance, uh, uh, we used to have, of course, in those days, the, the grand silence after night prayers. <clears throat> and uh, uh, we also had a very, very strict uh, rule. You could never, under any circumstance, go into a seminarian's room. The most you there could do would be uh, a total silence about floors. So uh, if you wanted to know, you, you didn't get proper indications of the lessons for tomorrow. And we want to come to find out for me, and then your class, you would go to the deacon in your part of the corridor say, I'd like to go to Jim Charles from the astronauts. He would allow you, you would come to the room, knock on the door, and stand outside and say, you know, what's the thing to say? Now, that's how strict it was. Now, we had this guy, uh, Dave Hoffman, he never became a priest, actually. Uh, he was uh, from Germany, as a matter of fact, but uh, American. 
go in in my class, uh, what he would do, like uh, after night prayers, he'd run ahead of the whole crowd and come into the room here. And everything is dark now, it's, not, it's 10 o'clock. And he, the, the light switches on that wall, he would put his two fingers there, you know. And then you would come in to get the light switch and he'd feel <laughs> <laughs> oh, creepy. <laughs> I might even scream. This is a, the grand silence. <laughs> but yeah, in those days, the more the restriction you have, the more, uh, I think, uh, deviltry <laughs> would result. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you wouldn't have recognized the old seminary. It was so different from your experience. Sure. Deacon Jay just sent a picture. He's at um, Wegmans right now. Oh, yeah. And he just sent a picture of him in line trying to get into Wegmans and everyone's standing six feet apart or 10 feet or whatever it is. Yeah. That's, that's remarkable. That's not hard of me. Yeah. This is why we go, we make uh, Deacon Jay go uh, do grocery shopping. <laughs> we sit here drink tea. <laughs> There's just no way you like caviar. There's just no way. <laughs> you don't like garlic. You don't like sausage. You like caviar somehow? That's just not possible. Not possible. I hate sausage. That's about the show I found. I will rob up anything else. Mashed potatoes. You, know. you don't like mashed potatoes? No, I eat them, but I mean, I, they're nothing. I'm never thrilled by it. Yeah, you know, you're like, not wow, like, I want is, mashed potatoes. This today. is tremendous. All right. Just taste this. <laughs> <laughs> Just, well, what if they add like a bunch of bacon to it and like sour cream? And, no, you know. well, I wouldn't too much care for that. I don't too much care for bacon unless it's. It's very, very crispy. I'm pretty sure the other day, maybe a couple weeks ago, we made you a bacon sandwich. No, and, you haven't. No, I did. No. And, and then I made it. You made it for me. Uh, and then you and, made it. No, definitely on your plate. I was talking to you one second, turned around, talked to where maybe it's Father Bob or Deacon Jay, and then turned back to you, and the sandwich was gone. You devoured that. Well, probably. I like bacon, you know. That's very, very possible. I know. <laughs> I'm gonna tell Deacon Jay to get some bacon. All right, you want to wave goodbye? Oh yes, hi.